19th, 2020, and today we're going to talk about chapter 18 of the gospel according to Spiritism. Many are called, but few are chosen. Before I begin, please subscribe to this channel, hit the bell so you can be notified, and put a thumbs up that you like it and comment please and share this video this video was is will be on facebook right away facebook kardec facebook page but i'll put it on youtube in my bit shoot channel so and you can watch it at any time you would like so let's get into it and i many are called and few are chosen now interesting is it not it, it implies that there's a there's a, a big class you know, kind of like any tough class you see in college or other places, but at the end of the course, there are a few remaining. And I think this has a lot to do with us at this stage of our lives here on earth and at the stage of the life and the culture and the journey of the earth from a planet of expiation, of atonement to a planet of regeneration. Now, why do I say that? Because I think there's many people here on earth that are called to help us move our earth, our collective human society forward. But how many of us step up and do it? So let's go, and, and I think you're gonna see, very interesting, I think you're gonna see these parables that become more alive in your, in your mind and where we are today. So let's start this. So, Alan Kardec starts this chapter with the parable of the wedding feast, which I'm sure many people have heard, but let, let, let me read it. It's Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again in parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants, and treated them spitefully, and slew them. But when their king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is re ready, but they which are bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore to the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out the highways and gathered together as many as they could find, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was a man who had not had on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then he said to the king, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many were called, but few are chosen. So that is the end of the parable. So let's talk about this, because I think it has. It had a lot of pertinence during the time of Christ and during the time when Christ, uh, Christianity was spreading throughout the Roman Empire. And I think now is another vital time for this. So let's go see what Alan Kardec says. I will quote from him. Those who are incredulous laugh at this parable, which seems to be childishly ingenuous because they're unable to understand that there could be so many difficulties in going to participate in a feast. And even more so that the guests would resist the invitation. And to such a point as to massacre those who have been sent to them by the master of the house. Parables, say the incredulous, beyond doubt, are figurative, but nevertheless it is not necessary to ultra, ultra think about the limits of possibility. The same may be said about allegories or ingenuous fables if their respective outer coverings are not removed so as to find their hidden meaning. So let's talk about his hidden meanings. In this parable, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven where everything is happiness and good fortune, to a feast. When referring to the first guests he invited, he alludes to the Hebrews, who were the earliest people to be called by God to know his laws. Those sent by the king are the prophets who came to advise them to follow the road of true happiness. 
However, their words were hardly listened to and their words were discarded. Many were massacred like those in the parable. The guests who declined the invitation with the excuses of having to look after their pastures and their business symbolize those worldly people who, being absorbed in terrestrial matters, remain indifferent to the things of heaven. It was common belief amongst the Jews of those times that their nation had to achieve supremacy above all others. In effect, didn't God promise Abraham that his posterity would cover the face of the earth? But as always, they paid attention only to form and not substance, believing it meant actual material domination. And who can blame them for that? But before the coming of Christ, all peoples, with the exceptions of the Jews, were idol worshippers and worshipped many gods. If a few people superior to the vast masses conceived the idea of a unique God, that idea remained only a personal belief. Nowhere was it received as a fundamental idea, except perhaps by a few initiates who hid their knowledge under a veil of mystery impenetrable to the masses. The Hebrews were the first to publicly practice monotheism, and it was to them that God transmitted his law, firstly through Moses and later through Jesus. From this tiny focal point, the light, which was destined to spread throughout the whole world, went forth to triumph over paganism and to give Abraham a spiritual posterity as numerous as the stars that fill the skies. Nevertheless, having completely abandoned idol worship, the Jews scorned the moral law and persisted, persisted in the practice of an external cult, which was easier. Evil came to a head and the nation was destroyed, enslaved and divided into sex. Now this was this was the war, this is the emperor of Vespian, when the Jews revolted this is after the, uh, the death of Jesus. And the emperor Vespian and his sons, I think Titan finished, uh, finished, this, finished it off and just like destroyed Jerusalem and just spread them. And they were tired of the, of the, of the revolts. Um, because, because the, you know, they were excellent. The Romans were excellent warriors, but so were the Jews. They were, they were excellent warriors. So I guess they had to, you know, completely defeat this, this warrior class. So it was at this point that Jesus appeared, having sent to call them to keep the law and to open up a new horizon of future life. Having been the first to be invited to the great banquet of universal faith, they rejected the words of the celestial Messiah and sacrificed him. In this manner, they lost the rewards which should have been reaped from their own initiatives. So, then Alan Kardec goes on and says, it's unjust to accuse the entire population. The main responsibility rests with the Pharisees and the Sadducees who sacrificed the nation through the pride and fanaticism of some. Therefore, it is these, above all others, whom Jesus identified among those guests who refused to appear at the wedding feast. Then he goes on to say, it's not enough to be invited, and it's not enough to say you are a Christian, nor to sit at the table in order to take part in the celestial bank banquet. Because before all else, it is essential as an express condition to be clothed in the nuptial tunic, that is to say, to be pure of heart and to comply with the spirit of the law. So, this is why this is, this is why there are many who are called, however few will be chosen. And again, we're seeing that today with spiritism. In the 1850s, spiritism became uh, pretty well known throughout the world. And remember, spiritism, uh, his uh, Alan Kardec's first book, the Spirits book, which I recommend everyone to read. And of course, you can get this in PDF. Just look up Alan Kardec. You can also hit the picture of Alan Kardec on my uh, nwspiritism.com channel, and it'll take you right to a bookstore. You can buy his books. You can also find his book in paperback or Kindle on the Amazon. Of course, you can get it free on PDF. So in the 1850s, Alan Kardec codified by using many mediums. He, he wrote a series of 1,019 questions. He asked the same question of mediums, and he didn't use the answers unless different mediums and different geographical areas came back with a similar or the same answer. This made sure that he wasn't following the advice of one errant spirit, right? Who thought he knew everything. We've seen that from many other books. A lot of the information is good. I'm not putting those things down, but it was not organized by the spirit of truth. 
And this had, and of course, around Allan Kardec, as he was doing this, they had many high spirits, Socrates, Plato, and then, you know, helping him write this book. He was, he was not a medium. He, he was an intuitive medium, which we all are. So, of course, that rose up in popularity, and then it was kind of squashed by the church. There were uh, the different religions, Protestants, Christians, uh, Catholics. You know, they did not like the Spirit's book. It was too liberal for them. It said that divorce is, you know, not necessary. It's not necessary to be married forever to someone you don't love, uh, those type of things. And they didn't like that, of course. And the whole idea of reincarnation kind of, and this is why the idea of reincarnation was taken out of the Bible in the first place, because it took away the power of the priest to make sure that you were to completely depend them, dependent upon them in one life. And you had one life to do everything right. Otherwise, you were in bad trouble. And of course, if you had a priest, he could guarantee you, you would be absolved of everything. So now, the spirit world knew that this was not the way to go, right? That's why they started spiritual. That's why they brought the spirit of truth to take away the power of the organized religion and give it to individuals so we can decide for ourselves. And this is the point we are at. Now, this is extremely important. We are all independent agents. We don't need, you don't need to go to a spiritual center, although I encourage it because you learn, but there's no rote prayers. There's no things you have to wear or food you can't eat, right? It's all about learning and understanding where you are in your own spiritual progress, the people around you spiritual progress, and then it gives you a path if you wish to follow it to help yourself and others around you. And this is what they say, many are called, but few are chosen. We all need to take that to heart because those who really go to the wedding feast and wear the wedding garment, which is, you know, was true in just right after Jesus. And it's true again today. So we can spread and we can talk to people say, you know, there, there is forgiveness, but you don't have to be perfect in this life. Look at your life as an arc, right? Don't look at your life as a single episode. It's like looking your, at your life like a week. And if you look at your life, like, during a week you were in high school, we'd all be condemned to, you know, to hell forever. Because, you know, who knows what we all did in when we were that age. I'm sure a lot of people did really good things. But a lot of people like me, we had our backwards times and did horrible, stupid, stupid things. So if you look at that way and you say, you know, your life, you know, because look, at this God so unfair to judge people in one life if you were born into this criminal family and and all around you was this chaos no that was something that was to teach you something and and maybe that you did everything wrong and that was to teach you everything wrong in your next life is going to have to atone for that so this is where the more we take that to heart and as we spread the fact that you look at your life over mul multiple centuries right thousands of years and bring this calmness especially during this time of the pandemic this will help everybody now let's go on by what what he means because this is again i think it's very pertinent to where we are today so Now, let's go on his next major point. That is, not all of those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this is Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 19. Actually, I'm sorry. Chapter 7, uh, verse 24 to 27. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but that he doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye worked in iniquity. Those who ever hearest those sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. 
and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, shall not be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Whoever shall break one of those least commandments shall teach men, so that he shall be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And the last was Matthew 5, verse 19. So what is, how does Alan Kardec interpret that? And I'll tell you how, give you my extra kind of thoughts. Alan Kardec says, all who recognize the mission of Jesus say, Lord, Lord, but what, a, what of what use is it to call master or Lord when you do not follow his precepts? Are they Christians then who honor him with the exterior acts of devotion while at the same time making sacrifice to pride, selfishness, greed, and all the passions? Are they then his disciples who pass their days in prayer, yet show themselves no better, nor more charitable, nor more indulgence toward their fellow beings? No, seeing that as the Pharisees, they have prayer on their lips, but not in their hearts. They can impress men with their manner, but not God. In vain, they can say to Jesus, Lord, do we not prophesy that is to say? Do we not teach in your name? Do we not expel demons in your name? And he will reply to them, I know not who you are. Go away from me, you commit inequity. So, what is he, what Alan Kardec is, is interpreting is that just having the outward remnants, right? The outward cloth, the outward appearance of being a devout person is, you know, it's a start. And I'm not going to say it's, it's not good, but you need to then fulfill it and, and internalize it. Now, why is that? So let's give some examples. On earth, giving the appearance of someone who is devout is makes perfect sense and most people cannot see through it right if they look like they're devout and they act like it but in their mind they're always thinking bad about people or they you know or whatever like that are doing bad things that you can't see that's all hidden no one sees it but this is where spiritism tells us so much nothing is hidden the, the the great one of the great revelations besides the fact that you are who you are when you pass away death is just a transformation the the other great revelation is everything you do is recorded right every thought is taken and put in the universal database nothing is missed so it doesn't work that you just appear humble and charitable and a nice person you must also act it, and if you can, if you can start internalizing it and thinking it, you will make a huge leap in your spiritual maturity. Now let's talk about heaven for a second. Let me carry on here. So now there are people who are very nice, and the people there are people who have never done anything wrong, and they go through life. They're polite to everyone. They really don't go into gossip, but they just kind of live their life in a passive manner and try to stay out of trouble and do good as they see it. But it's they have no really understanding of the spirit world or anything beyond that. And these are people who will, when they die, they will go into like one of the first levels of heaven. There is this great passage in this part in the book, um, Violets on the on the Window Seal, or Violets on the Window, I should say. And this is a Patricia who died, I think, when she was like 19. Her family was spiritist, and she went to a spiritist colony. And she found out there's a lot of people in this colony who just was really happy in the colony. And there was classes teaching them about the spirit world. There are classes teaching people to volatate. Volatate is when you move by thought, right? You don't have to get in a, you know, they call them air buses in, in the books, get an air bus and be taken somewhere. No, you can just think and you can go somewhere. You can, you can hover up in the air and there's all lots of information about how children in heaven play games with volatation in the books by um, 
Jibao, and I put those in my book, Spirits in the Spirit Universe. And and how, you know, so there's so much to learn. And this is where I think this is the, the difference between those who really will start ascending rather quickly and those who are good people, there's nothing wrong in that, and that's a great foundation to have, but those who won't ascend. And that is that intellectual curiosity and that commitment to transform your character and your personality. Because these people who are in that first level of heaven, and Patricia was teaching them, because when she died, she was already a spirit, as she knew. And they said, oh, be a teacher. Many of them, you know, they just, they had no, uh, no urge no curiosity, no intellectual drive to go to the next. They were just happy where they were. You know, God bless them for being that. They were nice, happy people. But in this, in this transformation from a planet of atonement to a planet of regeneration, we need happy people, but we need happy people who are motivated, hard workers that will carry through what they know of their faith and their firm foundation, to what they need to do. And this is why the next part is even more important to us. So there's a lot of things that are pertin pertinent to us who are spiritists now, and spiritists, hopefully, people who read the Spirits book and look at my YouTube channels and read other articles by other people and other books by other people besides mine, will become spiritists because that is what we need in order to move the earth forward. So the, next, so the next thing that comes, and this is all like one after another, is much will be asked of he who receives much. So this was in Luke 12, uh, verse 47, 48. And the servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did his according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But that he knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever is given of him shall be required, and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. And then in John, uh, verse 9, 39 to 41, and Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore you, your sin remain. So, as Alan Kardec wrote, these maxims apply even to more to the spiritual teaching. And this is this is the, the and of course, this is hard. This is why the gospel according to spiritism is so good, because it's hard to get, I mean, the gospel of spiritism, in a few words, says this is what it really means. So he says, Whoever knows Christ's precepts and does not keep them is certainly guilty. So you can see when he says, you know, hey, you you know, if you can see, then you need to see. And that's what he said to Pharisees. Well, yeah, you see, but you're sinning because you see, but you're not doing the right thing. If you're if you're blind, then you know, you don't you don't even know about that. You haven't you you don't know that yet. And that's where like when you when spiritism talks about atoning for past wrongs. Spiritual say, if you're completely ignorant and you're a primitive spirit, right, and you use something we think in this in this civilization is bad, but you had no idea it was bad, that's not a bad mark against you. That's a, you know, that's not something you have to atone for. They're going to try and teach you something, probably very subtly. Now later on, if you keep doing the same thing, the lesson won't be so subtle. So, so the main thing of this is if you know the the precepts, the tenets of, of spiritism, and you consciously violate them, then that's not going to do much good for you. Why know them and not act upon them? Now, you probably know them, but you still can't get over what your, what your desires are. So you just have to keep working those things, right? You don't have to be perfect, but just keep working. Get on that trend line and try to improve a little bit. So anyway, Alan Kardec says, However, besides the fact that the gospel which contains them is only found scattered in the bosom of the Christian sects, even amongst those, how many are there who do not read them? And even amongst those who do read them, how many are there who do not understand them? 
The result of all this is that the words of Jesus remain lost to the majority of men and women. It is important to note that nothing is circumscribed within the teaching of the spirits who reproduce these maxims in various forms. Every person, be they learned or illiterate, believer or incredulous, Christian or not, is able to receive them because the, spirit, the spirits communicate in all places. No one who receives them either directly or through an intermediary can allege ignorance. It is not possible to excuse oneself under the pretext of lack of instruction, nor even that of the obscure allegoric meaning. Therefore, those who do not take advantage of these maxims to better themselves, who admire them only as something curious or interesting without allowing them to touch their heart, who do not become less futile, less prideful, less selfish, less attached to material things, who are no better towards their neighbor, will be all the more guilty in proportion to the number of ways open to them to acquire the knowledge of truth. Now, that can seem harsh, and and because look, let's look, let's talk about that. So, if you know about these things and you don't follow them, then you're actually more guilty than someone who has no, no, you know, you know, than, than some ignorant tribes member in the middle of some forest. And it's true, and you know, let's all talk about when we were young. Now, I'm sure a lot of people who are younger, and they do really well. Me, I'm probably probably the norm, which is unfortunate. I knew the Bible. I went to the Episcopalian church. I knew I should have been less prideful, less selfish, but I wasn't. I knew these things, and therefore I was, you know, and I just, you know, I just rationalized them away. Ah, nah, I, I'm okay. I'm, I'm still better than most of these other people, right? That's, you know, you always think of things in relation and context. And this is where I, I do not like this moral relativity because this is where this, this attitude comes from is, well, if other cultures, you know, do this or do that and it's okay, then that's just, you know, your relative, you know, moral relativity. You can, you can still, you know, be a cannibal because these other tribes do it, but here's not good, but you know, it's not bad. Well, no. So, just like other other cultures have slavery, no, we do not want slavery because we know that is wrong, and this is why I think moral relativity is wrong because there are divine laws, and the Bible, New and Old Testament, shows us the, these divine laws. They don't reveal them completely, but they're there, right? And then Spiritism really t tells, okay. Karma, right? Your conscience has a set of divine laws. When you do bad things, when you do selfish bad things, even your, you know, you don't treat people as you want to be treated. Those are against. Those are against the divine laws, and therefore, you are, you are just setting yourself up to have harder trials in the next life. And this is where. Once you really understand it, once you internalize the fact that there is reincarnation, there are multiple lives, and that karma and the law of affinity is is what works the whole process of reincarnation, right? That's what you know. Karma is the one that is is kind of a is the is the governor of reincarnation of how you are reincarnate, where you reincarnate, your trials, and all that, because karma is the recording of what you've done and making that recording of what you need in the future and then your present was done from a recording from your past life and your life as a spirit because you can learn in the spirit world too they say so all these things add up and that's why once you that's the one of the most important thing to do is in your heart understand that karma is real and that you are just one life of many and once you understand that, everything then becomes in their proper, in their proper measure. You have the proper frame of reference. I had this wonderful high school teacher, Mr. Helene, and we had a, a class, and he talked to us about the frame of reference. And we looked at newspaper articles, and there's like a newspaper article as an example when the uh, communists, the the Soviet Empire. Uh, 
came in to the uh, Prague summer in Czechos, uh, Czechoslovakia and just, you know, wiped out the people, tried to be, you know, this is like in the 1950s or 60s. I can't remember which. Um, and then he showed us newspaper articles, you know, one like from a Western newspaper saying, oh, these poor freedom fighters. And then with the, the Soviet Union saying, oh, these re rebels, they were doing these terrible things, right? And he, he taught us that everything is based on your frame of reference. And that you you know you need to just get what the news is, and of course we need that. Everyone needs to put that hat on today because our news is so biased and so incorrect. They don't care about the truth; they care about shading what you know what they want as far as their political um, bent is. So you know you can't really trust anyone. It's even worse than it was than when when I was younger. So. The same thing with this moral relativity. They don't want us. They they want us to put everything through that. No, everything's okay. You're fine. You can be, you know, you can, you can do these terrible things, but somewhere someone's doing them. So you're just the same. No, it's wrong, right? It's wrong is wrong. It's against the divine laws. And therefore, we need to recognize that and speak out. Now, I'm not saying speak out and lose your job because I know in the United States, people saying, you know, bless you, you know, a teller in the bank would be fired because you can't, you know, people just don't want to hear religion. So do what you can, though, but don't hurt yourself on that one. But on your own, decide what you can and try and, or at least be a beacon, an example for others of what it means to be a very nice, calm and yet spiritually aware person. So, then he goes on, uh, Alan Kardec goes on, it says, in the sentence, if you were blind, you would not have sinned. Now, Jesus was to signify that the culpability is according to how enlightened a person may or may not be, which is what I was just talking about. And then he says, much, this is what Alan Kardec says, much will be asked of spiritists because they have received much. On the other hand, to those of taking every advantage of their learning will be given much. Therefore, the first thought of all sincere spiritists should be to find out if in the counseling received from the spirits, there is not something which applies to themselves. Spiritism will multiply the number of those who are called. Likewise, growing through faith through the proportion of those who are chosen will also be multiplied. So, and it's interesting. Now, when I join a uh, a spiritist mediums meeting. Now I'm not a medium. I'm on, I'm on the back wall being as quiet and positive thinking as I can be. Right. If you're ever in a mediums meeting, don't let your mind wander. Just kind of sit there, close your eyes and think love, right? Listen so you can hear what's going on. And it's hard because you get really interested in these conversations, but it's very interesting. So on the, everyone I've had and the, the spirits, it's so interesting when uh, the, the spirits communicate with us. And I've actually had quite a few I've, a, 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 um, YouTube videos on spirit communication uh, lately from all this pandemic, giving us ex uh, advice and everything. But for this mediums meeting, at the end of the meeting, usually someone will speak, you know, it's like the, the head spirit will say, okay. And then he'll, he'll tell them, he'll, he'll tell them this. And this, and, and this is why, if you ever go and a medium says in, 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 in a medium who's like probably not a spiritist medium and someone says to you, oh, the spirits think you're a great person and everything you do is wonderful. Well, you know, that's fake, right? Because I have never heard that. All I ever hear is like that seventh grade teacher saying, well, you did okay, but you need to improve this, this, and this. You know, it's always this extra thing to go. And it's exactly what I hear in the meetings. Meeting. You'll hear like, well, you know, all of you need to need to study more and work harder, right? It's not like, oh, you did great. You can go home and have a drink. No, 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 no. I never hear that. And so that's why uh, it's always it's always an exhortation to do more. In fact, uh, one of the uh, uh, mediums gave a, um, uh, he's a medium, but he also gave a, he was gave a talk during one of the, the spiritist meetings and he was saying yeah I, I was on a business trip and 
I was sitting, you know, on this table. I was drinking some wine. I said, oh, this is so nice. I can finally relax. And then the spirit said in my mind, no, sorry. You always have to keep working. That's why you're on earth. <laughs> and he just laughed. And, and of course, you know, that's, you know, that's the way it is. You're not going to be, you know, being on earth, according to the spirits, someone can put me in the comments and say I'm wrong, is we're not here. This is not a summer vacation camp where we're here to, you know, canoe on the lake and have fun and, you know, make little you know, baskets. No, we are here to learn and to work. And those who of us who are given much, it, we ex, there is expected much of us. So if we were one of the, if, you know, we were called and we were chosen, well, then we have to come up with the goods. Let's go to the next one because it, it pertains exactly to this. And this one is, <clears throat> let me see, this is what? Oh, Matthew, Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 10 to 14. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they they because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. So Jesus, when he gave his talks, think about this for a second, and think about how you, when you talk to other people, when Jesus, Jesus gave his talk and talked and talked to massive amount of people, did he think, oh, they're all going to say, yes, I understand. I am going to, you know, you know, just embrace this, this new word, this new doctrine, and it's going to be wonderful. No. He knew, he knew that most of them would hear the words, right? But not really understand them. But that was okay. Because they would think of them later. And if they didn't think of them in this life, they might think of them when they were in the spirit world and saw the spirit world around us and go, ah, this is what Jesus meant. And in fact, when my wife and I went to our first mediums meeting, and we were given a message and saying, okay, everything you're doing, you're just planting seeds. Don't think that you're going to do anything great, right? This is why I, I, I do what I can. And I, you know, I don't worry about how many people watch me or you know, come back to me. It's always f fine when it does. But I'm just trying to put this information out there for everyone to see and then to think about later. And you may not even think about it in this life. You may think about it in the spirit world or in the next life. But the fact is that that little seed has been put in your mind. And therefore, for those of us who are spiritists and those of us who are working, we were, were given much to help and work and do more. And then, as he said, those, you know, those who, who were given and, and, you know, and not, and, and, you know, and those who have and weren't given that things should be taken away. Right. And but given to those of us who need the resources to do what we need to do. And this is, this is why it's so pertinent right now during this time of moving the planet from atonement to regeneration, because, you know, there's a lot, there's like Vanessa and Carol and uh, uh, <clears throat> all these all these wonderful people, spiritists, are making programs like every night, Sergio, every night uh, and days on Kardec Radio. They are just trying that you, you've noticed there's this new flood of, of commitment of just getting the word out there. Now, are they reaching thousands of people? No, they're reaching hundreds of people, and they're, and hopefully. Those, it, you know, it's like to make a beach, right? It's one little grain of sand at a time. 
Hopefully those hundreds will talk to other people and it will grow and grow and grow. That's all we can do. And though for each one of us that are here, and if those who are not spiritists, but are just interested in hearing what I'm saying, and if you're a spiritualist, because you're, you're probably here at least because you believe in, you know there's something besides just that we're this carbon-based life form and that when we die, we're nothing, right? You wouldn't be listening to this video if you didn't think there's something more than what you see and feel, right? Therefore, in, you know, encourage other people to learn. They don't have to be spiritists, but let them learn about the spirit world. Tell them, you know, there's, tell them to, you know, become, tell them to understand that we are more than just what we are, is what our culture or current culture tells us, which they try and, and you know, our current culture tries to really create these automatons who are just materialistic and consume, right? Because that is what the elite want. They want easily governed people that go to work, pay taxes, and consume. That's all. No, that's not why we're here, and we're not here to make those type of people rich. We're here to improve. Now, we're put in these situations so we can improve our character and our personality. And, you know, so we shouldn't try to hurt those people, you know, the you know, people say the means justify the end, right? The end justifies the mean. I should say, no, it doesn't. It's the means justify the end. So what we do is we have a quiet, peaceful evolution of spirituality that will take us to the next place. So let me carry on with what Alan Kardec has to say. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, but whoever hath not from him shall be taken away. So Alan Kardec says, let's meditate on these great teachings, which have so often seemed paradoxical. He who has received signifies those who possess the meaning of the divine word. They have received it solely because they have tried to be worthy of it and because the Lord in his merciful love animates the efforts of those who are inclined towards goodness. By their unceasing perseverance, their efforts attract the blessing of God this acts as a magnet calling to itself progressive betterment. It is these copious blessings which make them strong enough to scale the sacred mountain on whose pinnacle is to be found rest after labor. For whoever hath not are, little, are but little shall be taken away. This should be understood as a figurative antithesis. God does not retract the good he has conceded. Blind and deaf hum humanity, use your intelligence and your hearts to see with the eyes of your spirit, listen by means of your soul, and do not interpret so coarsely and unjustly the words of he who makes the justice of God shine. Respendently before your eyes, it is not God who takes away from the one who has but little, but the spirit itself who, by being wasteful and careless, does not know how to conserve, increase, and bring fulfillment the little which have been given to that heart. So, what we are being told here, and you know, you can read the finish reading up this chapter on, on your own, is the importance of understanding that once we have once we have the knowledge, right? We have the knowledge of the universe, we have the knowledge of spiritism, that we need to then act upon it. Now, if it's just casual knowledge and you don't really have it, but you just kind of think about it, that's okay, right? It's better, at least in this lifetime, you've been exposed to it. But what we really want is, is for those who have more than ca casual knowledge is to really dive deep into it. Okay, so I have a, this is a good question here. Because I was asked to explain what spiritism is all about in just a few words. And this is what, how I would do it. I would actually follow what Spiritism says. First, I would say the basic summary of Spiritism is to follow the golden rule. But Spiritism, really, what it is, it is a knowledge that was brought to us by Alan Kardec about the spirit world and its process. And the main processes that it teaches us about are reincarnation and karma and the fact that we are an immortal soul who go through life after life to improve ourselves. And that's really, that's the juxt of it, right? That is the important part of, 
of spiritism is that idea of reincarnation and karma. Now, why is that so? I why is that so important? Because for the first time, and I talk about this in uh, in my book Heaven and Below, and book two, how uh, spirits and spirit universe, and book three, how we're guided by spirits. For the first time, spiritism tells us what's awaiting us, right? Before spiritism, everything has been kind of fuzzy. There's no fuzziness. It's it's there. It's real. You go, you you take off this dense body because your, your ratio of matter to energy is huge amount of matter, low amount of energy. And as you go up and up in the spirit world, you become less matter and more energy. Like Jesus is, you know, pure spirit. He's probably, I don't know. He could be pure energy, I'm not quite sure, or very little matter. So that's the important thing. Now, there's another question. Since we don't remember what we need to do in this lifetime, could our guardian angel communicate what we need to improve in this incarnation? And the answer is yes. In fact, they are always communicating with us what we don't listen or we don't pick up the sights and signals, right? There's signs and signals all around us. And I talk a lot about the signs and signals that I see, and of course, you know, uh, in my book, The Seven Tenets of Spiritism, which to me was my own, my own journey to how I found spiritism and how it, the signs and signals were there that led me to it. So, and that's a question a lot of people have, like, well, how can I improve if I don't know what the heck I did wrong, right? And that's a very good question, but amazingly, it's you know it's like a first grader or second you know second grader, right? And, you know, if a first grader says, "Well, mom and dad, how can I how can I learn unless I understand the lesson plan?" Well, but the the way the teacher puts the lesson is they just naturally want to read, they naturally want to sing the alphabet, right? They just they you know these things like they just use their their behavior and then put them in a certain area, right? So this is what is so smart about the spirit world. So there's a couple ways that I really like to answer that question. One, analyze your life. And I talk about that in my, my book, The Problem is the Solution. You analyze your life and you see the type of trials you went through. My big example was every time I got a, you know, a pretty good payoff from work or whatever, I always lost it. Well, you know, I found out in the meetings meeting and the, I should, if I known spirits before, and I would have figured this out. Is I took advantage of when I was in positions of power, I cared more about taking their money than you know giving service to the people that I was responsible for. So that was one of the things. So of course, I you know I should have if I'd known spiritism back then, I would have figured it out. Now I know that I'm not destined to be rich, right? I I'm you know living on my my modest pension, right? So I'm not destined to have any money because I don't deserve it, which I understand perfectly, and I need to learn to live with what I have. So first, look at your own your own life and your trials and see what really kind of hits you in hard in the heart, right? And then you go, oh, well, you know, if that happened to me, I must have done that to somebody else, and I'll never do that to anybody else now. Don't, you know, don't take the opposite lesson and saying, oh, you know, my ex-wife was really mean to me. I want to get revenge on all the women I can. No, that's not the lesson you should take. You should take this, you know, if you're a man or you're a woman, whatever opposite one you are, are, are the same, you know, however relationship you were. If that person was really mean to you, the lesson is not that you need to take revenge on every other person. It's that what you had done before they're doing to you and therefore, you understand how it hurts you deeply. Don't do that again, right? Say, I'm not going to put that much pain on somebody else. So you can do all of that without a medium or anything. Now, the other ways is one is analyze your dreams. What I did, now, of course, all of us have Foolish dreams that mean nothing. So don't worry about those. But if you have a dream and you might want to start that is like write your dreams down. And I do a lot of this. I just videos on how to interpret dreams. In fact, I'm going to interpret 
a uh, lady's dream that sent me a really involved set of dreams. I'm going to do that Tuesday on my YouTube channel at uh, five o'clock Eastern is learn how to interpret your dreams. The first step is to always write them down. And then when you write them down and, you, and I, and I wrote my dreams, I would look at them and I think, Oh, I don't, I don't know what this one means, but then like a year later I'd figure it out. And then you start, you start knowing that because first of all, you have to understand your dreams are full of all, like symbolism, because when you're in the spirit world and you're in this four dimensional thing, right, where time is actually a separate dimension and you see objects before, during and after kind of thing, you don't understand how to interpret them. It's like the, uh, the Indians in Mexico, when they saw Cortez's ships come, they said, well, there's mountains on the ocean. What are those mountains on the ocean? They had no idea what they're looking at, right? Quite, quite so. You have no idea what you're looking at, but you do your feeling. Like if you have a dream and your feeling is good and you thought you were talking to your aunt Mary and she's telling you something that might be a real thing to follow and you felt good about it. And it was someone you kind of knew that's, that is a dream that is real. In fact, I had this one woman tell me that, you know, her, her, uh, her father talked to, you know, her, she had a, a son that died prematurely and you know her father said yeah i talked to him and said could we have done anything to keep you alive because no i was all set it was all for the good i'm coming back don't worry about it and you know the father's able to understand that from the dream i i you know summarize it really severely but the fact is that is if you fail good right and you saw this person you knew and you could remember the words that's telling you something but there's also symbolism. I've had dreams with symbolism. I have dreams with numbers. I write the numbers down. And sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, that's what it meant. Here, here's an example. This book, Seven Tenets of Spiritism. I was writing this book. And I had a dream about a month before I finished the book. And it was like my wife's sister. She held up a number and it said 117.5. I go, oh, what does that mean? And I wrote it down. Okay, 117.5. Well, you when you write books, you don't know how many pages it is till, till you're done, right? So I looked at my book. Oh, then I also had another time a vision of I was at a lake and I was skipping rocks. So then I put the book in. I said, all right, get, you know, I, I had a person do a cover for me. And the book, the, the book, the Seven Tenets of Spiritism is my fifth book. It has exactly 117 pages. And then when the cover came back, as you can see here on the screen, it's a bunch of rocks on water. The, those were, you know, prophetic dreams. So interesting, is it not? Now, and so the same thing can happen to you, but you need to then, you need to get yourself aware. Uh, and of course, now, do I fool myself sometimes? Absolutely. And I'm always really worried about that as fooling myself thinking, oh, maybe this, you know, and, you know, sometimes and uh, invariably my first uh, interpretation, whatever I think is going to occur, like when, when we have messages from spirits during mediums meeting, I'm wrong. I mean, this is why, you know, when these people prophesize things and they and they try to interpret some way, and a lot of people say, "Oh, you, you're wrong. You didn't know what you're talking about." Well, it's hard to interpret things that we the spirit world knows what they're talking about. And they use very few words and they use very exact words, but it could mean something that we don't understand at all. Therefore, when someone writes down something that they do it in a dream and they say, oh, "This is how I interpret it," in your own mind, think, "Well, it may be different, right? There may be reasons." So, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is very doable. And the more you study yourself and you write these things down and the more you study spiritism and you understand, the important thing is understand how the spirits want to help you, right? The spirits aren't going to tell you, oh yeah, there's a pot of gold in the backyard under the fifth tree on the right. That's not going to happen. They're going to want to, usher you and guide you into a situation where you learn and become, you may help other people 
and it will also help you morally and spiritually. It may make you poorer. It may be, make you less, you know, desirable to whoever you want, you know, to impress. It may make you, you know, all these things. But if you, in your conscience, when you're thinking you're being uh, shifted somewhere and it makes you feel, this is the other big test, and it makes you feel less stress, right? You feel the, the, no weight on your shoulders. You kind of feel good about it, even though it's like, kind of neutral as far as helping you out in your career or your money or whatever, something like that, then you know it's usually the right thing. So that that's my opinion, and I'm sure other people have much better opinions. But that is what I would do, is just be aware and start looking. And see, Carl Jung says, that he, he coined the term synchronicity, right? And he was not a spiritist, but a lot of it was he, you know, he didn't know about it you know when when you know when he, during his time uh, it was around but he probably you know, didn't read about it but you know he knew that the spirit world was trying to point us into different directions by um giving us these little little out of the blue things right so that's that is what i think would help anyone understanding where, where, where they should go, what they should do, and then, you know, and you know, analyze your past trials. So I want to say thank you for everyone for being with me tonight. And remember, I'm going to start, I uh, have been doing on my YouTube channel, please subscribe, that I'm going to do at 5 o'clock Eastern, uh, my YouTube live stream. And I'm talking about, oh, actually, next Tuesday, I'm talking about a... Um, a person's really involved dream and she asked me can you do a, uh, a program on this and i looked at it and i go well this is interesting so i'm going to do it uh, so anyway i hope everybody god bless everyone go out there improve yourself and talk to other people about spiritism and god and try to keep everybody calm during this time of hyper excitement for you know that you know we shouldn't be that excited this is all about life anyway god bless all of you god bless